just want to say welcome. Uh, you're not here to talk, to hear me talk. You're here to uh, listen to Senator McCain. Um, back in July 14th, when the uh, Iran nuclear agreement was announced, um, that they had come to an agreement, I was sitting in my hotel in Washington, D.C., and several hours later, I went into Senator McCain's office, and he addressed us on this issue. He didn't even have the talking points yet, but um, before the agreement, but he had some suspicions. And uh, he's really been a, a, a champion against the Iran agreement on Capitol Hill, but also in the state of Arizona. He's held a, a couple of events. This is a, a second event for us that he's held to talk about. It. Now, that's uh, settled policy. And so today, we're going to um, listen to him and his insider view on, on uh, where U.S. policy is going in the Middle East and what are the consequences or things that we can look at coming from the Iran nuclear agreement as it's implemented. So, again, please give another round of applause for Senator McCain. Well, thank you, John. Thank you for all the great work you do. Thank you all for coming today. And if you don't mind, I'd like to come a little closer. I find the further away I am, the, uh, the harder it is to communicate, so I think don't mind I'll come a little closer. Um, I want to thank Ashrat uh, Israel Center. I want to thank the Arizona Republican Party, the Pima Republican Party, and the Victory Worship Center, and our college Republicans who are helping us uh, today. My friends, uh, I have never been more concerned about the United States than the world today. When I became the chairman of the Center Armed Services Committee, we had hearings. First of all, I remember that 60% uh, of the United States Senate has been there six years or less. So we had hearings in our committee to try to educate all these new members of the Senate. We had the smartest people in America. Uh, Henry Kissinger, George Schultz, Brent Scowcroft, Madeline Albright, you name them before our committee. And the reason why I mention this to you is because all of them said exactly the same thing. The world has never had more crises since the end of World War II. There are now more refugees in the world than there has been since the end of World War II. There is an existential threat to the state of Israel that is greater than perhaps it's ever been, and it's a direct result of this flawed agreement with Iran over nuclear weapons. I hope that some of you saw Bibi Netanyahu's speech. Did you see it? Did you see it? <laughs> remarkable speech, remarkable statement. And I'd like for every American to be able to see his speech that he gave. It was, it was moving and powerful, but perhaps more importantly than that, it was true. It was true. I'll be glad to go over a lot of the details with you and the reason why this agreement is flawed and fatally flawed. But remember, the Iranians continue to call for the extension of the state of Israel. So we've made an agreement, a place that is so close to all of us, Jerusalem. By the way, my favorite place on earth to visit is Jerusalem. To see the sun come up on the old city is something that is incomparable in our lives. It brings so much to mind about where it all began for those of us who call ourselves Christian. So um, I'd like to talk to a lot of you about the details of the agreement and why it's bad and why it's flawed. But I'd also like to start out by telling you what's going on in the world today. The United States of America has never been weaker than it is today. Let me give you an example of what's happening in Syria as we speak. We, uh, we found out approximately a week or so ago that the, that the Russians were moving in aircraft, anti-aircraft guns, fighter aircraft, and, and uh, all kinds of tanks and artillery and other equipment. By the way, they brought in anti-aircraft weapons <laughs> ostensibly to fight ISIS. ISIS doesn't have any airplanes. <laughs> so it was pretty obvious what they, what they were doing. So in response to this, our Secretary of State 
Like, why should we call Slav call Slav off? The, the, the Russian foreign minister, not once, not twice, but three times, concerned about what may be happening. And then the President of the United States has a 90-minute meeting with Vladimir Putin. Okay? And they come out and nothing said. 48 hours later, I'm not making this up, 48 hours later, a Russian general knocks on the door of our embassy in Baghdad to inform us that in one hour, airstrikes are going to commence by the Russian airplanes in Syria. Only they said they're going to, they're going to bomb and attack ISIS. My friends, it was not ISIS they attacked. It was these young men that we have trained and equipped and sent into Syria to fight against ISIS and Bashar Assad. And then the airstrikes began and they killed a large number of these young men. And did we defend them? Did we defend these young men? This is, this is immoral. To send young men and train and equip them, send them to fight, and then not protect them against airstrikes from Russia. Now I'm telling you what's going to happen now. And very likely to happen. Bashar Assad was in real trouble, which is why Vladimir Putin stepped up the, the fighting and uh, had the assistance, and the Iranians are coming up a deal. The next thing will probably happen is you'll see the Iranians act to, against these uh, Free Syrian Army folks in order to preserve an area. I won't go into a lot of the details around it, but the connection between Aleppo and Damascus. And what are we going to do? What are the United States going to do about that? So, say that again.
Syria, not the United States, but them. So this, this agreement lays the groundwork for a very much revitalized Iran that is still committed to the extermination of the state of Israel. My friends, uh, this, is, this is, as I said, the most serious situation that I have seen. Now let me, let me give you a little good news, if I could, real quick, and then we'll come back to the Iranian agreement. The United States of America is still the strongest nation on Earth. The United States of America still has the best military on Earth. We still have the highest quality men and women who are serving our nation, including here in Arizona. I'm proud of Davis Monson and Duke Air Force Base and Yuma and Fort Huachuca. So we, we have the strongest nation in the world. But I'd also point out to you what the best news we've had in a long time is we are now energy independent. For some of us here that are old enough to remember when OPEC shut off the gas and we sat for hours in gas lines. Remember that? Yeah. They can never do that again because we are now energy independent. Okay? In fact, if we did the right thing, we probably won't have this president. If we could get energy to Ukraine, it's now being flared in the north of North Dakota oil fields, and they could be independent of Russian energy. So that's good news. The second good news is that manufacturing jobs are getting better. Now, I've got to, I've got to add, though, even though unemployment is 5.1%, we have a larger number of Americans who have given up working, looking for work than at any time since 1973. And that is really bad news. And that's because, you know, we, 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 I won't bother with one into it, but it didn't have to happen that way. Third of all, there is new devices that are changing the world, and that's these. My friends, this is the greatest change Oh, the greatest change in history since the invention of the printing press. Now, my wife makes me buy a new one every time a new one comes out. And somehow I make it bigger and heavier. And sooner or later, sooner or later when I'm going to turn my pocket, but uh, it, it's remarkable. You know, I have um, members of my staff that don't own a television set anymore because they get all their information online. Uh, we, the, in the, the Republican debate, I don't want to talk about that, but for the Republican <laughs> debates, do you know what was the most used vehicle? Was Instagram. Of all, the, the, all of those. About three months ago, I was asked to go over to Venice, California. I don't hang out there, I don't bodybuild much anymore. But I was invited to, to address a group of employees uh, of guess what? Snapchat. I was needed, I was met at the door by a 25 year old young man clad in Levi's and a t shirt who was worth $4 billion. The CEO of Snapchat. So I went in, and there's not a young, uh, about 150 of the employees who talked to him, not one of them was over uh, age 25. And it's remarkable. All of these things, may be, some of them may be made in China, but they, they are invented here in the United States of America. Every single one of these technological advances. So I've got to tell you that I'm optimistic about the future of America, but now I'd bring, like to bring it back to reality today. The United States has not faced more crises, as I said in early in my remarks, than they have against uh, since World War II. And the state of Israel, but you are committed to and believe in. We can't return to the Holocaust. These, these people want to destroy Israel. That's their number one target. We're their number two target. But they want to destroy Israel. And what are we doing? What are we as Christians doing? And by the way, do you know who their number one target is of ISIS? Christians. Do you know? that they enslave young Christian girls? I hate to even talk about it with you. It's so repugnant. Do you know that they take young Christian girls and they treat them as slaves? Do you know that? It's a fact. It's a fact. Do you know that there was a young woman from Prescott, Arizona named Kayla Mueller? Kayla Mueller was endowed by a, a desire and an ambition to serve others. I mean, truly, Christian, principle motivated young woman. 
I've seen the videos of that connection made. She went to Aleppo. She was working in a hospital there. She was captured by ISIS. Her parents, Carl and Marsha Mueller, I know extremely well. We did everything we could to get her out. And guess what? She was murdered. She was murdered. But not after she was Baghdadi's. Well, she went through a horrible experience before, before she was murdered. I went to her memorial service in Prescott, and I'm telling you, I was deeply moved. Because not only for Kayla Mueller, but think of all the Christian young women that have been treated by this guy while we sit by and watch. So I guess what I'm asking you to do is to stay active, not only to practice your faith, but demand of our leaders, demand that we stop this, that we do what is necessary. And I'm not talking about World War III, don't get me wrong, but there is a, a very large number of options that we could take which could stem this tide of radical Islam and stem the tide of Iranian hegemony, which they're trying to recognize their age-old, their age-old ambitions, thousands of years old, the Persians who wanted to dominate the Middle East. And we need to rise up and demand of that our leaders act. And by the way, let me just tell you some of the ways that, that we could act. One thing we could do is tell Bashar Assad to stop the barrel bombing. And we're going to shoot down your helicopter or your airplane if you continue the barrel bomb, we set up a safe zone where people can be free uh, as an as a, uh, area that they can't be attacked, where they can practice their, their religion and they can live in some security. Then we need, obviously, to train and equip for Syrian army people. We need to have a vigorous uh, anti-ISIS campaign that would be successful. And there's a number of other steps we can take without declaring World War III, but stand up as America has always. We've always stood up. That's been the greatness of America. And the problem with this president is he doesn't believe in the greatness of America. He doesn't believe in American exceptionalism. My friend, the world was uh, is so much of a better place throughout the 20th century, despite the Holocaust, despite the wars that took place, because of American leadership. Think of what the world would have looked like if, it, if Hitler had had his way and we hadn't been there to save Europe and the world. And it was, it was bought with enormous blood and treasure, expenditure by us. So, I want to thank you, and I'd like to answer your questions, but I'd like to thank you. I know everybody here has something else to do, on this Saturday afternoon. And I know that you have very many responsibilities and things to do. But you're here because you know that we need very much to stop, to stop what's going on, to show our solidarity with those who believe and those who are struggling for freedom. And I want to thank you very much for your commitment. And my friends, our prayers were never needed than they are today. God bless. Thank you. Bye, thank you. to do what we can to alleviate the pain and suffering that is being inflicted 
by the worst forces of evil that we have seen in hundreds of years. We ask your blessing on those who are fighting, and in our armed forces, and the brave young men and women that are standing out to ISIS and to Bashar al-Assad and struggling to have the simple ability in right to practice their religion in peace. And we especially pray for the state of Israel today. There is no greater threat to the state of Israel, in the words of their leader, Benjamin Netanyahu, than there is today from the state of, from the Iranians who are committed to their extinction. We thank you for the blessings of our family and our friends and living in still the freest of the nation, freest and most beautiful nation on earth. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.
in, in Korea. But it's an interesting story. They were surrounded by the Chinese and they fought to the last man and they decided that they would have one person surrender to the Chinese so he could go back to Turkey after the war was over and tell the story of that battalion. And they're really great fighters. I'm sorry to tell you that their leader, this guy Erdogan, is a man who's consolidating power, repressing the press, and he lost an election. And now he has been attacking the PKK and Syrian Kurds. Not just the, the PKK is designated a terrorist organization, a Kurdish organization. It's just a little complicated, but he's attacking them. He also agrees with me and you that Bashar Assad is the enemy much more than ISIS. So when we wouldn't attack Bashar Assad, then he wasn't going to play. Now recently he has allowed us to use, the Turks have allowed us to use the air base there in Turkey called Insulik, which makes it much easier to launch air attacks into Iraq and Syria. But he's got an election coming up, and what he's trying to do is consolidate power to keep himself in power in perpetuity. Turkish people are wonderful people, and, but I'm very worried about the actions. And right now, he is attacking the PKK with his air capabilities, Kurds, more than he is ISIS. And that is not a, a good thing. My friends, what all this is, and that really sounded kind of complicated, and it is, it's what happens when America abdicates our leadership then all these different forces begin with movement and uh, the PKK and Kurds and, and all of this because the vacuum is then filled. And I can guarantee if we were having this conversation four years ago, it wouldn't be nearly the complicated one we're having uh, today. So could I go? Uh, hey, yes. Could, well, actually, could we do this lady here so we can be gender neutral? <laughs> I'm, going ask, I'm going to ask a loaded question. You're telling us to do something, we pray, but how do we get the members of Congress to do something? They do not respond in the way that the public is asking them to act. Well, I'm sorry. This is what presidents are about, really. When, when we had crises during the eight years of Ronald Reagan, he would sit in the Oval Office behind his desk and he would look the camera in the eye and say, my fellow Americans, this is the problem. This is what we have to do about it. There is no leader like the president. And this president, rather than leading, is totally uh, disengaged. Every member of Congress is important, but our Constitution says that the President of the United States is the Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces, not, not members of Congress. And so our Constitution gives him, as Commander-in-Chief of all the Armed Forces, the, 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 the ability to do things foreign policy-wise. We can't have 535 presidents or 535 secretary of state, even though they all want them. So uh, I believe that, that the attitude in the American people has dramatically shifted. When Americans saw Americans beheaded on the internet, when they saw that Jordanian pilot, that horrific burning, when they see these things, more and more Americans now are in favor of us acting, but they don't know how we should act. That's what it requires of presidential leadership, to lay out a plan, and because they have no strategy and no plan, they can't tell the American people what it is, because they don't have it. So, uh, if we, uh, honestly, to goodness, if we had a Ronald Reagan, and by the way, there's a number of Republican uh, candidates that I think are highly qualified. Don't forget my friend Lindsey Graham. I'm all the way up with Lindsey Graham. Um, so, uh, but we have a number who could do exactly what Ronald Reagan did when he came to office. I would remind you, and there's for some of us who remember, that, um, uh, that there were a number of American citizens being held hostage in our embassy in Tehran 
The day that Ronald Reagan raised his hand and was sworn in, those hostages came home. Why did they come home? We don't know why they came home. And so we need a president. And I believe that if, some, if that president said, here's what we need to do, my fellow Americans, and say A, B, C, D, and E, and I want you to tell the Congress of the United States to give me that power to do that, I think overwhelmingly the American people would, uh, would approve. And unfortunately, because this administration doesn't have a plan or a strategy, they can't tell the American people, except we can be angry, but, and by the way, General David Petraeus testified before our Armed Services Committee and he laid out exactly what we need to do. And I'd be glad to send anybody his one-page description of, of what uh, we need to do. Yes, ma'am. Before I go back to that wonderful lady's question, um, I want to say thank God that we have Kufa. Uh, I thank Hashem because I'm not a Christian. I'm here on my Sabbath because this is to save lives, and Kufai does, and Senator John McCain does. We will never forget the 44 seconds of deafening silence, because you do are not silent, and Senator McCain is. And I'm going back to your question. If we don't have leadership at the top, Israel would be in worse trouble if we didn't have Congress, sir. So I'm going to ask you, I'm going to beg you, Two questions. Silence is one thing. Going against Israel is another. And we have a senator who right now is doing that. And that is Senator Feinstein with her intervention in the supposed village, which doesn't exist, of Susia, and getting other senators. It's a, it's a Supreme Court of Israel. By the way, the head of the Supreme Court of Israel is a woman, and I'm not a chauvinist, but I'm glad she is there. They're one of the most independent courts in the world. They have said through maps, through history, through everything, that there is no such thing as a village of Susia. And that Senator Feinstein brought people, children, and women in Agar uh, to the Senate, sir and has gotten other senators to agree that the Supreme Court of Israel is wrong. That's one thing. What can you do about that? And the second thing, I'm looking for action. Israel needs those bombers. It needs the bunker-busting bombs that go deeper than they don't have. Isn't that up to Congress, both issues? And you are one of the strongest of them I have ever in my life encountered. What can you do to fix it? Please. Well, you covered a lot of territory, but the main thing that I can do to fix it, frankly, is to have hearings before our committee and to write legislation requiring assistance to Israel, such as you mentioned, the bunker busted bombs. My friend, some of the facilities that the Iranians have have been dug deep into mountains. And right now, the Israelis do not have the kind of a bomb that we have developed, which would penetrate deep enough to strike the Iranian nuclear facilities. Uh, and, and by the way, I hardly went through it, but the inspection procedures call for it in this agreement are a farce, a joke. Uh, yeah. Yeah. 24 days afterwards, then they go to the and now we're going to rely on the IAEA and rely on the Iranians to give us some report. I mean, it's, it, it, I, if anybody here is interested in, in a list of the absolute fallacies involved in this agreement, I'd be glad to. But what I'm hopeful that we will do is, and I think we're starting to do it through both the Farm Relations Committee and the Armed Services Committee, is to write legislation which requires the provision of these weapons, which requires us to develop David Sling even more rapidly than we have. By the way, there's a thing called Iron Dome that Israel and the United States developed. I know that many of you are familiar with it. If we hadn't had Iron Dome, I guarantee you there would have been cities on fire in the state of Israel. That was a result of the United States and Israeli cooperation. 
So, again, I promise you that there is a strong majority in the Congress of the United States, not just Republican, there are a number of Democrats as well, that are committed to this relationship, and we are trying to do everything we can to assist them to make the best they can out of what is clearly a threat to their existence. And some of the issues that you mentioned, we are working on. I promise. I promise. But we, we, we have been through bad times before, and I appreciate your commitment and your love of Israel. But we have to just keep working. All I'm saying is don't give up. Because we, if Congress has the power of the purse, yes, and and all this money is going to countries that that are against us or against what we believe is right. You believe is right, but I believe is right. What most of the country seems to believe is right. But then, then, and this one president is standing in the way of all this stuff, and we're uh, we're giving them, we're funding them. We are absolutely funding them, and and, and you're telling me the Constitution isn't working. You're telling me in this country the Constitution is dead. I can I cannot believe it. I mean, if, if the Constitution is working, then we should be holding on to every cent that's going to all those evil countries. Well, that let me just say. And, that the, and why not? Okay. Uh, good. Can you grab the microphone now? Back. Um, money, the, money works. Right. But let me remind you that the Constitution of the United States of America says. That the President of the United States has veto power. And in order to override the veto of the President of the United States, it requires a two thirds vote of the House and the Senate. We have a majority in both House and Senate. We do not have a two thirds majority in the House and Senate. Every appropriations bill. Could I, just, could I just remind you right now every appropriations bill in the United States Senate? We are trying to pass the Democrats are blocking. And we just and we just passed what we call a continuing resolution to keep the government going for another three months because they would not approve a single appropriations bill to go through the United States Senate. And if we had if we had passed it through the United States Senate, the president still would have been told it, and we cannot change the Constitution of the United States of America. The Constitution of the United States, I'm sorry, ma'am, but the Constitution of the United States says that the President can veto legislation and it requires a two-thirds vote. Now, you may want to change the Constitution of the United States, but honestly, that requires three-fourths of the states in order to get that done, and it isn't going to happen. So what we need to do is elect, in my view, and I know there are Democrats, Libertarians, and Vegetarians here united, <laughs> united in one cause. But in my view, to satisfy your concern right now, is to elect a Republican president who will not be so yeah. yeah. Sir, my name is Michael. I'm from Israel. First of all, thank you. Do you agree with me that the greatest experience is to watch the sun come up on the old city? Yes, that it is. Sir, at the current state of things, we are surrounded by our enemies. We do not feel we are only left behind this president that he has betrayed us. He has put the government the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. He does not help President Assisi. Russia helps him out. Is there anything that can be done to give us at least the bombs in order to bomb those bombers? Because at the current state, my government does not only face the nuclear threat, which Iran explicitly said it will operate against us in order to make us extinct. And Iran just bought $21 billion of weapons from Russia to do so. Can you give us weapons regardless of the president? And, and I think we will, and here's why. Because the president had such a backlash from the 
pro-Israel community and the evangelical community in this country that he wants to try to soften that blow a bit. And I have heard that the administration may be proposing some new weapons for Israel, but we also will be driving that as well. So thank you very much. God bless. Yes, ma'am. I, uh, I want to encourage everyone here. Can I hang on here? So that, there you go. Hi. My name's Kathy. I have a son that is a um, corporal in the Marines. He's a reservist. And on Facebook, his uh, girlfriend was, um, uh, her uh, Facebook was, it, was hacked by ISIS, and she was friended. I found it within 45 minutes because I got a whole spirit in here, and she shut it down. So if you think, I'm not trying to put fear out there, but if you think that we are far from all that's going on over there, we are not. And our president is not, he's not protecting us or our military to a point that is good. And I just, he has an agenda, and I believe it's Islamic. And therefore, we need a, as you said, there are things we can do. I have written congressmen. I have written my senators. I have written Dem my Democrat congressmen. And, you know, I mean, I am a Republican, but I, I've been doing that as we the people. And I've been doing things. And I get, I, I get generated mail back and that from them. Um, actually, Senator Flake has been really, really good. And I believe I wrote you and I got something that made sense back. <laughs> but, I mean, everything else was, you know, we have a president, we're going to stand by him. You know, it's just very ge generic. And, um, but we have to be, we need a list. We need something we can do. We are the people, but like, like I said, I don't want to be, we're also, we also obey, as Christians, we obey the authority placed over us. But we, the people, have to do something. And our God, it, he's, everything he does goes against everything that's biblical. Everything that is biblical or even just common sense generated. I mean, it's it's a constant thing in every avenue. In every avenue. Even just racial riot stuff that he could have calmed down. So where do we go from here as a people? Well, first of all, could I say I understand your passion and it's shared by many people, including there is a lot of people who are very angry at in this an undercurrent here, and a legitimate one, that we don't do enough in Washington. And that is, of course, given rise to a lot of the anger and frustration. And frankly, the top three individuals who are now in the running for the Republican nomination have never held public office. And that is an indicator of the, of the dissatisfaction that a lot of people have. Let me just disagree with you for a second, though. I don't believe that President Obama is Islamic. I believe that President Obama is, is, is a person that is a family man and an honorable person, but he does not believe in America's role in the world. That is the problem with Barack Obama. He doesn't believe that America should lead. And my friends, as I say over and over again, I'm sorry to be so repetitious, without American leadership, think of what the last century would have looked like. And now, in the 21st century, he has advocated uh, American leadership, and I think that's that's the problem. And so, so finally, can I say, um, I understand the, the frustration with Washington. Uh, there's a approval rating of Congress of 12 percent. Is there anyone in the 12 percent that approves of Congress? Please raise your hand. If you just raise your hand, please do not drive an automobile here. <laughs> <laughs> I, I landed at the, at, at, uh, I came through Dallas uh, yesterday and landed at the airport. A guy ran up to me and said, Say, he said, anybody ever tell you to look a lot like Senator John? <laughs> I said, Yeah. <laughs> and he said, Doesn't it sometimes just make you mad as heck? <laughs> so, <laughs> so I understand your frustration. <laughs> I promise you, I have never worked harder in my life than I have as chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee. That's why we had David Petraeus before our committee, who said, who said, 
I think you have to be politically active. Get behind those candidates that you believe in. That this election can be won or lost by voter turnout. You know, we have a primary that's in August and a lot of people are doing other things. I, I, if, if I had one plea, it is that you be, make sure we elect people to public office that understand this need for American leadership again. That's what I'm asking you to do. And if you don't find it I work satisfactory, then go get behind somebody else's, even though you may be a dummy for doing so. But, they, <laughs> but, uh, but, but seriously, political action is called for now. But I also want to point out to you again, America is still the greatest nation on earth. Our Judeo-Christian principles will prevail. We will succeed. God, we, we are the, uh, maybe some people may take exception to this, but I think that America in many ways is so blessed that you could even say that we're a chosen people. And that's why our young men and some young women have gone to all four corners of the earth and shed their blood in somebody else's freedom, in defense of somebody else's freedom. So I want you to, to be positive, but I want you to act and I want you to be alarmed. But that doesn't mean we give up. That's the last thing we want to do. So thank you for your passion. And could I just tell them in the back, my folks told me that I, and then I'll go to you, sir. Thank you, Senator McKinney. Uh, if by some very, in my opinion, probably unusual set of circumstances, Donald Trump were actually to become the President of the United States, yep. and I know he has not apologized to you, and I strongly believe he should, in your fellow servicemen, that was a cowardly, sniveling comment to me. That's my opinion. But if he were to somehow become president, do you think he would be a good one, a dangerous one, a mediocre one, or is that a question you really don't want to comment on? I, I, I think that, first of all, if uh, no matter who the nominee of the Republican Party is, I will support that nominee if it's a fair and legitimate uh, process that, that the majority of my fellow members of the Republican Party uh, choose. But, but second of all, what I worry about with, uh, with Donald Trump, and I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to get into a fight with him or anything, but when he says that he would sit down with Vladimir Putin and talk with him, and that he could convince Vladimir Putin, I don't think he understands Vladimir Putin. And when he says that he's going to round up 11 million people and deport them, I'd like to know exactly how you do that. <laughs> so, so there are legitimate questions that I think need to be asked, but I will support the nominee of the Republican Party. Um, by the way, I, I have to comment to you, you know, you see uh, Secretary Clinton's numbers continue to uh, decline and over a number of issues, but particularly this whole issue of this server and all that. And I keep hearing these people who are my friends who are supporters of Secretary Clinton say, look, here's what you've got to do. You've got to get it all out there. Get it all out there and you need to get it behind you. You know, that's really a great idea unless you're guilty. <laughs> that's not such a great idea. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so, yes, sir. Go ahead. Right, we'll get you. Last question. Uh, so my name is Steve. Originally from Africa, Burundi. It's my country. Uh, it's a beautiful country. Thank you very much. I want to talk uh, to you today just about the country. You know, uh, we are facing a president who is only one third term, and now we have to kill him. Uh, right now, I think he's running for a third term against the Constitution. Against the Constitution. So uh, I get also a message uh, about when the people is crying uh, because uh, his uh, her husband or kill the police. I'm asking please uh, beg you to help my country. If possible to kick out the president or to bring him to dinner with the police. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you and I will continue to try to get a situation where there is respect for the constitution of your country, which if he does in the third term, then obviously that is in violation and there are a lot of human rights abuses taking place uh, there. Thank you. Uh, could I just, uh, I, I really have to go and I know you do too. Can 
I want to again say, everybody in this room has something else to do today. I thank you for being here. But please don't give up on America. Don't give up on men and women who are serving in our military. Don't give up on the fact that America is still the greatest and strongest nation in the world. And stay active, stay involved, stay engaged, because I really do believe that this nation is put here to do a whole lot of things. And I am so proud of what we have done before, and I am optimistic about, with the right leadership, what we can do again. And finally, all of us know that prayer is very important. Thank you very much.